It says in 2 Chronicles 15, 2, the Lord is with us as we are with him. And you seek him, you'll find him. But if you forsake him, he's going to forsake you. I, I always just grew up thinking, you know, you're saved, you're Christian, I'll never leave you or forsake you. But you can leave him. It says in Revelation, you've left your first love. The Ephesian church, they had services every night, evangelistic services, they had ministries every night of the week at their church. But the Lord says, I have this against you, you've left your first love. Where are you at in a relationship? I just, just before I came here, there's, I had a, we've had a lot of car problems lately, and uh, the, the wheel bearing we just put in a week ago was bad out of stock, and I stopped at the store there, and they were going to give me about 175 about a $100 part and switch them out. And my first instinct was, wow, that's nice. Switch the same part and give me a much, you know. But I told a the lady, there, there's a part in me that just, just wants to get over there. But then the Lord comes. And I said, you know, that, that's not, you're not giving me the same one. I don't want you to cheat yourself, you know. But I, I wasn't always like that. You know, it wasn't always like that. But may we be honest and upright. He knows everything, as Mike said. You know, he knows what's going on in our life. So let's, uh, let's start out in Job. Uh, want to uh, continue in Job. You know, the, I remember at a previous church, there was a, uh, uh, when we would bring in members, they would share a testimony. Uh, and then you would ask him if you have any questions, but he didn't have any. But the, after it was over, he said, I, jokingly, he said, I was going to ask you about predestination. Give me a definition. This was 25 years ago, but, you know, people predestined, you know, some people believe that. That false doctrine that if a person has eight kids, you're around the table with your parents. You know, God's predestined you four to go to heaven and you four not. The call is to all of them. There's a guy working. The Lord's leaking on him. I mean, he's, he says to me, I don't know why God chose me. You know, his brother's been in and out of jail. I don't know why God chose me. I says, I can tell you that real simple because you chose him. You chose him. So it's, it's your choices. The call goes out to everybody. And the predestination is every one of you, I can tell you your predestination is to be conformed to his image. That's the marked out plan he has for any one of us. Will we get there? I don't know. We have to obey the Lord to arrive at that predestination he has for us. But, uh, you know, when the Lord says three scriptures that are very similar in the scriptures, you know, God has a big vocabulary. He doesn't need to repeat himself. But there's three scriptures here, starting in Job chapter 1. After he gets all the news, um, Job chapter 1, verse 20 and 21, Then Job arose, rent his mantle, shaved his head, and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. After he had all this bad news, he didn't even run down where the accident had taken place. He looked to the Lord. Verse 21, and said, Naked I came out from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. Thither the Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I've been an eyewitness uh, four times to that. I've seen my three children and my first grandson, Jordan, born. You come in buck naked. You know, <laughs> You say, that's not rocket scientists. No, it isn't, but we need reminded of it. And you're not taking anything out of here. They said Alexander the Great, when he, I don't know whether where he was spiritually, but for some reason I read this in a devotional, when they were marching his funeral procession up to the gravesite, he had his hands outside the box. He wanted everybody to see that he couldn't take anything with him. Nothing with him. So it's a good reminder. Job, Job, God had, Job didn't have a Bible. Yeah, I think it was one of the oldest books ever written, the book of Job. You know, it, uh, Job had the Lord. He didn't need a book. He had the Lord. And the Lord communicated to him that naked you come in this world and naked you go out. The Lord had worked that into him. It wasn't just something he come up with, but the Lord had worked it in him. And this is not morbid. This is reality. The Lord wants to show us some things. I like this Living Bible. I've been reading some of these translations here. 
It says, Then Job stood up and tore his robe in grief and fell down upon the ground before God. I came naked from my mother's womb, he said, and I shall have nothing when I die. The Lord gave me everything I had, and they were his to take away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God gives, God takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. This is the second. These are three scriptures that say the same thing. 1 Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6, we'll start in verse 6. Godliness with contentment is great gain. We could stop right there and, and preach a message on that. Godliness with contentment is great gain. That's many people today are not, they're trying to find satisfaction. There was a young man yesterday, and I thought he'd be here tonight, actually. And I don't know whether we have the, the numbers marked on a church or not, but he said he was coming. But we had a wonderful time. Uh, I took, well, actually it was Wednesday. We took the day off and we were riding and we see this kid walking and we saw his truck uh, pulled on the side of the road and picked him up and spent time with him. I'm looking in the rearview mirror. We're on the side of the road here and I'm seeing these trucks coming this far from me and I'm saying, Lord, you see where I'm at. <laughs> you know, I'm hearing your will. But he, he wouldn't even get out of the car. I'm, I'm sharing. He, he, he's been all over California. He's been all over the place looking for satisfaction. He's been to, uh, I think, Kent University College. He's been all these places. His mother died of cancer when he was 33, but he, he's like, I don't know, he's in his 30s, but he, he's sitting there like this. He's listening. <laughs> he didn't even want to get out of the car. So you preach the gospel in season, not a season. Anyone who uh, looks at the clouds and say, well, I don't know, it looks like it might rain. I'm not going to sow today. No. Sow your seed in the morning, eat, even in the evening, keep sowing. You don't know where this is all going you keep preaching in and out of you know in and out of season whether you feel like it or not you keep preaching and so it's you know he uh the lord touched his heart we prayed for him and, and it was a great blessing my wife and i took the day off and vacation day and i we couldn't think of a, a better time we spent probably about an hour hour and a half with him but it was very satisfying being about the lord's business if I was about my kingdom, I wouldn't have any time at all for him. But the Lord sees value in every person. Do you see value in, in the person who walked by every day and you don't even know his name? God's, every person is valuable before God. And uh, they need to see Jesus. Not so much hear about him. Many hear the gospel, but not many people see the gospel. See, we need to see it. We need, we need to be the Bible in shoe leather. Don't tell me. Missouri's a show me state. Show me. Better to see a thing once than to hear about it a thousand times. Example, it's powerful. Example, is powerful. Godliness with contentment brings great gain. I was looking in the rearview mirror. He's just there like it. <laughs> Very encouraging to be about the Lord's business. You're not living for you. You're living for Him. For we brought no thing in this world, we brought nothing in this world, and it, it's certain. That's, that's, that's clear. That word certain means clear. It's, it's very clear here uh, that you, you can carry nothing out. Having food and raiment, let us be there, there with content. They that want to be rich, it's talking to Christians, it's written to the church. And you have some Christians actually try to justify that, say, well, there's some unbelievers in that church there. It's the Christians. We like the Holy Spirit shovel. You know, the word's coming and we're, we're shoveling it back here. It's that person. Boy, I hope that person's listening. And we hear the word wicked. We think it's out there somewhere. No, we can be wicked. I can be ungodly towards my wife if I'm not careful. Ungodly is just unlike God, how God would be, how, how God would act. Ungodly. They that want to be rich, talking about Christians, fall into temptation and a snare, many hurtful desires and lusts, drown men into destruction and perdition. I like uh, Living Bible it says the, the love of money is the first step towards all kind of evil. You know, the root, the root you can't see. The love of money is the root. The love, there's an affection for money. 
There's a guy at work, he would play numbers. I was 18 years old. He was, he was from Pittsburgh, and he'd have always, I always tell him, Bert. He was probably about 105 pounds. He ran numbers. You know, he was down the mill. He had his wallet here in his front pocket in plastic, and he fell down up, up underneath the heat one time, and I was up there, and he, he was grabbing this as he was going down. He, he was grabbing his wallet. You know, that's the way we are. You know, it's let it go. The real riches is Christ. That, that's, it's him. Money's not wrong. We all need money. But it's the, our affection towards it. Which while have some, some have coveted after, while some Christians have coveted after, they've erred from the faith. It didn't say they left church. You, you, they got mad they left church. Well, and if you read First and Second Timothy, it says many wander from the faith. It didn't say they left church. Demas, now he, he left Paul's apostolic team. But when the scripture says you wander from the faith, you wander in your heart. That's where you wander at. And the Lord looks at the heart. And pierce themselves through many sorrows. But you, man of God, you follow the right path. Faith, righteousness. You fight the good fight of faith. What's the fight going on against Jehovah's Witnesses coming to your door? I thought that years ago, but the real fight is keeping your heart right. Because many things are pulling at us, trying to give yourself to this. I told you over the years, people say, Glenn, you're a good salesman. Sell this, sell this. And I'm here like this in spirit. I'm here like this. I know how to make money. I could make money by selling things. Cars and whatever, I've done it. You know, I've, you know, I don't want to give myself towards... I always tell when I'm, any couples that I've talked uh, about counseling, and in fact, there was people that wanted, uh, there was a lady that wanted to get, uh, when I work at, she said, will you, do the, will you do a wedding? She just wanted some hocus pocus thing, and, and I said, well, will you sit down for a number of, of messages sitting down? And she's, oh, no, we just wanted you to come down to the park and just say a few things, and I, there's, there's many other people who tell you to do that. You know, it's, it's a great responsibility to, to put your blessing and join two together. There's a guy, I work a friend of mine, he's a Mormon. He's a friend of mine. He, he sent his nephew to me. He was getting married, and after the first, they came, and I said, well, let's come to my house and see if we're a perfect fit. They came the first week, and I said, it's months of counseling, once a week. You know, if you show yourself faithful, I'll be more than be faithful with you. I'm not worried about doing a wedding. I'm more interested in your marriage. Anybody can do hocus pocus, and you know, I'm more interested in putting something in you after you say, I do. But after on the way home, after he met, he says, hey, I wanted to ask you. I forgot to ask you. What do you charge? I said, what do I charge? I charge you to obey everything I tell you to do. That's what I charge. Freely you give. Freely, you know, you've received. Freely you give. I don't get paid for the gospel. You know, it's, yeah, I do get paid. It's, it's very rewarding, very satisfying to follow him. I was looking at uh, Acts 27 this week, and bear with me, I don't know where we're going to end up here, but Acts 27 is when they get on a ship there, and they're getting ready to sail. Paul's going in, into uh, Italy, I believe, you know, get to stand before whoever, Caesar, whatever it was, and they get ready to go, and the man of God says, hey, it's, it's bad weather, you don't want to go, there's a lot of harm and loss going to take place, but you know, it isn't just some people there that was on a boat, it's the whole world wanting to chart their own course, wanting to map their own, you know, course out. And who's going to listen to a preacher? I don't know if I'd go. I wouldn't go here, but they're pushing forward and they're going ahead. And because of that, there's harm and loss that take place. 278, 276 voices on that ship. Can you imagine all the voices Paul's hearing, and yet he hears one? He's got an ear for the Lord, for that small, still voice. The Lord spoke to him through the night and said, Take heart, brother, and we're all going to be saved here. But the ship's going to get broke up. You're going to have to go, go through some things. He didn't spare them. He's not going to spare you and I some trouble because he loves us too much to make it smooth for us. So the only one voice you need to hear in the storm is his. But many voices today, many voices. I don't listen to all that stuff out there. I'd have to think and tell you last time I listened to the news. This Bible is more up to date than the daily newspaper, and I'm not condemning anybody here if you watch the news or read the newspaper, but this is the greatest newspaper up, up to date more than anything you, you can have. You know, it's, I don't 
I don't give myself to, to worldly things. My Bible says to set your mind on things above. I like what uh, Pastor Mike said, you know, get your face out of Facebook and get, it in this, get your face in this book. That was, that was good. So, you brought nothing in this world and it's certain you can carry nothing out. Seen a guy on a red-eye flight. He came into Pittsburgh and I was a utility person years ago at, uh, working the, uh, up at the gate. And there was about 10 of us. Early in the morning, a red-eye flight is coming in from the coast. Everybody would have a certain job to do when it hit the ground. Some person would be the front galley, back galley. Some person dumped the labs, clean the windshield. But this one came in. There were sirens all over the place. There was a medical emergency. A guy flew the whole way. He had no problem. He was in first class. And he, he went in the bathroom, and, and uh, they were getting ready to land. I don't know the time frame, how long, but they were getting ready to land. And she knocked, you okay? And he knocked back, and all of a sudden, he fell against the door. And he, he passed away in, in 10 minutes. I wanted to rear galley, Tony, but I had to front galley that day. And I saw his shoes. He had change scattered around. And I said, what do you want me to do with these? He said, just stick in the bag and throw it out. You talk about wisdom. You can learn wisdom just by observing. You know that. Just by observing, you can learn wisdom, Proverbs. So just by watching. But I saw how he was 42 years old. I asked somebody uh, a couple weeks after that, a police officer, I said, what did he pass away from? An allergic reaction to peanuts. It's hard to believe. Hard to believe. But, uh, well, you know, we boast so much about tomorrow. We don't even know what, what the rest of today is going to be. I had a buddy that... Uh, was studying the anatomy of a body and he was doing ambulance duty and he he watched this film he says glenn you wouldn't believe it how everything in your body just has to just click you know just perfectly fit together one thing out of whack and it's over and i don't say this to scare you i i, I tell you this to hold dearly to the lord always add him in the equation it's not wrong to plan but add him in the equation in james there they were saying hey you who say, uh, let's go here, next week and do business, and year after that, we'll go over here. And what they were doing was boasting in themselves. Well, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And the writer, he asks the question, what is your life? And he never answers that. He says, what is your life? He only says what it's likened to. He said, it's, it's like a vapor. He doesn't really answer the definition of what is your life. He said, it, it's like a vapor. The Living Bible says a morning fog. It's here one second, gone the next. Working up on the air, air, uh, air side, they would have fog come in and settle in, and planes would have to circle around for an hour sometime before they could land. Your life, my life, is just a, a vapor. Just like that. What are we giving ourselves to? What are we thinking about? What's, what are we giving our energy to? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. On the day of a big game, growing up playing baseball and in coaching, I told the kids, don't be swimming on the day of a big game. I did, Ada. Don't be swimming on the day of a big game. You know why? Because they exert all their energy and they come to the sixth, seventh inning and they can't, they don't have any strength. Don't swim. Save your strength. So I'm careful what I give my strength to. The Lord says to love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So you be about the Lord's business. This is totally contrary. This Bible is totally contrary to the human mind. We're taught to take care of yourself. If you don't take care of yourself, no one else will. And the Lord turns, it, reverses the order and he says, Seek my kingdom first. Take no thought for your life. What you're going to wear. You're not the boss. I like that. When his wife said that last or two weeks ago. She got in the car and she, the, the, the Lord spoke to her. He wasn't her leader anymore. He wasn't her leader anymore. The Lord's the leader of the family. And there's an order there for sure. But is the Lord your shepherd? Is he leading your life? Okay, let's go to the third. Uh, is, is Ecclesiastes chapter 5. This is the third. There may be some more scriptures, but they're all the same, saying the same thing. When the Lord says three verses, the exact same thing, we need to pay, pay attention. Hold loosely to the things of this life. I believe when Job's sacrificing there, in Job, Job chapter 1, he's praying for his kids, he's praying, he, he's, he's holding things loosely. It, it's good to hold things loosely. So when it, it's ripped out, if you're trying to hold tight, it's going to be all the more harder, the pain, when it's ripped out. So you, you hold loosely to the things of this life. 
let's see, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, 15 and 16. I'll go back here, uh, verse 12. The sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eats little or much. If you don't have much, you can sleep, sleep good. But the abundance of the rich will not suffer from the sleep. There's a sore evil which I've seen under the sun, namely riches kept for the owner's hurt. Verse 15. As he came forth out of his mother's womb, naked shall he return to go as he came and shall take nothing of his labor, which he may carry away in his hand. Nothing of his labor. Nothing. I, I saw the guy today and I said, I think I'm going to be talking about you tonight. He, he laughed, but he's not a Christian, but the Lord's been drawing him. He had these older cars and he was telling me, you know, I built a relationship with him first. He was telling me, hey, he's got a couple older cars. He's been putting a barn there and saving them. He came the next week and I said, you know, I want to tell you, that's really nice. He says, what's that? I said, I was thinking about you keeping him cars for somebody else's future collection. That's really nice of you. And he looked. He, he went and took them cars out and drove them. He come back the next week and says, Glenn, thank you. I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying driving them cars. My uncle, who was a good man, 48 years old, I remember as a, early in my marriage, I was maybe 18, 19, we went out and he was building this great big house. He bought one house, sold it, built right beside it, sold it, built, and he was building a great big house in the back. And he's a great big barn, and he kept every car part he ever had, every car. He said, come here a minute, I don't want you to tell anybody this. And he had everyone in there. I asked his sons recently, probably about two years ago, is, is, have you done anything with them cars? And he says, no, they're still. Where's your treasure at? For where your treasure, your heart will be there also. Where's your treasure? Oh, you're not taking anything with you. In fact, you may destroy somebody if you leave somebody a bunch of money. <laughs> you think you want to leave your kid a bunch of money? <laughs> You just might send them to hell. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. I'm not saying don't help your kids out. We, we help them. We've helped them. I've helped them to my own hurt, my own kids. No, don't, you know, don't think I'm being cold. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Job was made better because he was sorrowing. See, we want out of a situation. We want out. The Lord says, no, no, I, I got you where I want you. I, I want to develop you in the situation. See, you want out, you want out, you want out. No, no, I, I want to develop you. I want to change you in the situation. Remember the guys in jail? If they're dreaming every day, I can't wait to get out. can't wait to get out. I, I've had some guys tell me their uh, brother-in-law's in. and He can't wait to get out so he can start partying. Can't wait to get out. Well, if, if that happens, a couple years you're in there, you're not going to glean anything in here. Jennifer with her cancer says, Dad, I'm not, I'm not saying get me out of this. I, I want rid of the cancer, but de change me, develop me, mold, make, shape me. I want out of here, Joseph says. Remember me. Remember me. And he was trying to get out of there, but the Lord brought him to a place that he said, you know, if I stay in here the rest of my life, if you, if as long as you're in here with me, I like the Lord says of Joseph, the Lord is with Joseph. You know why the Lord was with Joseph? Because Joseph was with the Lord. He is with you as you are with him. Oh, I'm a Christian. He's with me. Is he? Are you with him, Christian? Are you abiding in him? Are you dwelling? Are you remaining? Best verse in that story in Acts 27, the Lord, Paul hauls over the ship. They're trying to cut out and get, get away from the, you know, afraid the ship was going to bust apart and they're getting a little boat there and he hauled her down. He says, unless you abide in the ship, you can't be saved. That word abide means dwell, remain, stay. Same, same abide in John chapter 15. So it's uh, <clears throat> Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 1. A good name is better than precious ointment. The day of one's death is better than one's birth. Oh, I remember looking in the, all the babies there. You know, you, we all, most of us have been there. Oh, look at all the kids. There's the blue ones and there's the pink ones and, you know, the day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth because everybody's, they're all newborns, but the end of that matter, of what choices they made in life and where they ended up, there was one that was born, and I had to thank the Lord, not that he was in trouble, but hopefully he found the Lord in jail, but there was somebody of a great, uh, in the area, a sports guy, if I said the name, you'd know it, but his, his brothers had a baby in there, and 
I recognize that. And I saw, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago in a newspaper where he's on drug, you know, he's in jail and everything. And I, I thank the Lord in my heart, not because he was in trouble, but because the reward of following the Lord in your life. And don't worry about if your kids are not or not following. You obey the Lord. Your focus is never to be the kids. If you have kids that are wayward, get your eyes off your kids. Get your eyes on the Lord. Obey the Lord. Everything he tells you to do, Jesus told, or Jesus' mother told the, 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 uh, the servants. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. That's how you reach your children, by you obeying every word that com comes, you know, comes to you. I've tried. I've tried to change. I've tried. Well, give up trying. Peter fished all night long, didn't catch anything. When the Lord gave a direction there, they, they caught fish. So you just got to obey the Lord in your life. Don't worry about over here, over there. We have the day one's death is better than the day one's birth. It's better. This is, this is strange. <laughs> God's ways are, we need converted in our thinking. We need metamorphosed, we need converted in our thinking. He says it's better to go to the house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting. Who would rather go to a birthday party, a, a 50th anniversary, or all these things, a 90th birthday party coming up for my mom? Lord willing, if she makes it there. In the natural, we'd much rather go to that. But God says there's places He's ordained for wisdom in His life, and one of them is a funeral home or a place of mourning, whatever that would be. So it's whoever steps in a funeral home would say, oh, this, this is the place to be. This is it. Remember, I had a Bible school teacher when I was in Bible school, and he said, a wise man thinks about death a lot. That's not to be morbid. It's not... Not at all, but you always keep that before you. You, you. You're looking to the Lord, but you always, you know, I believe the Lord's working powerfully in, in Pastor Mike back there because he's telling me he's, he's I, I, I'm noticing, he, I, I'm hearing, I see some things clearing out out there, and he doesn't, his eye can't see, his, his ear can't hear, nor has entered into his heart what God's got waiting down the line for him as he continues to, to, to cut these things off. These are weights as you cut them off and obey the Lord. You know, I mean, but I see the God working in his life. I see him just even him speaking here just briefly. He's got some substance there. The Lord's working in his life. I think I, I still think the churches around the funeral, uh, the uh, cemeteries. Not that it's you got to have that, but here you couldn't have it. But I think it's wise. You know, in the country there, we're. The cemetery plots around the church. So you're reminded when you come to church. You're reminded every time you come. You're reminded. It's a good place. It's good to be reminded. Your time is short here. Don't give yourself to vanity. Psalmist says, "Don't you know? Let me take my eyes away from vanity. All these things are just stuff. Just gonna be left behind." My uncle going back to him. He passed away at 48, cancer. I think him, things are still in his barn there. I'm not faulting him at all. I'm just saying, what are we giving ourselves to? There was a guy at work years ago that he was burning candles on both ends, working overtime. He was uh, playing racquetball, and he was a mechanic. And I can remember he had a birthday around that time, but I can remember he, he was with his son. They were in a racquetball tournament there, and he was working like four, five, six doubles in a row. And I mean, he was around 50 years old. But he was playing racquetball, and he had a heart attack, and he was gone before he hit the floor. He was gone. Gone before he hit the floor. I lost three friends right prior to their 50th birthday. Uh, three fairly close friends. Uh, the one, I just stepped in my church on a Sunday morning, and her son called, and he said, uh, Dad just passed away. So I went out to the house out there. I'd never been to the house before they'd taken a body. And I went up there, and it was very sobering. Uh, you know, I remember as a kid, my mom taking me to funeral homes for my aunt. And I can remember they'd take me up to the casket, and I'm there like this. In spirit, I'm there like this. But it says, it's good place. It's a good place. The living lays it to heart. There's a girl that I work with that says, you know, I don't do funeral homes. And I asked the Lord one time, why don't you do funeral homes? Or why don't you do funeral homes? And the Lord showed me, because she doesn't want to see her end. She doesn't want to see that the time is quickly passing by. Redeem the time. Make the most of every opportunity. For the days are evil. Meditate on the word day and night. You can do whatever you want with the rest of your time. There isn't any. Because you're meditating on the word day and night. Psalm 
Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of the countenance the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth, pleasure. So Job is coming into great wealth as he's keeping a relationship, as he's loving the Lord through it all. Uh, the Lord is doing a good work in his life. I had both great opportunities to, sh uh, uh, to share it. Uh, actually, it, wasn't a, it was my buddy's father-in-law's funeral. And, and it, uh, if you ever have a chance, do it. If the Lord ever, ever have a chance to speak, you don't have to be a pastor. Maybe, you, maybe it's a family member. Don't keep your mouth shut. If, you have some, if the Lord's prompted you and you have something to say, tell the pastor. Maybe it's a family member. You'd like to say something. Maybe you have something someone in the church needs to hear. But I know when Mike called, that, that, he was to go there, and he, he knew it, and he went. And he was the one that was rewarded for his obedience there. But I remember it, the, one, uh, the one guy that passed away, his fall, uh, I remember speaking at the funeral, and when I was done, the daughter came approaching me, and I thought, this is, this is different. But she came up, and she said, I want to tell you, thank you for preaching the truth here. We all needed to hear this. Very satisfying. The greatest message is, I believe, is really at a funeral. You don't hear anybody talking about their 401k. You don't hear anybody talking about over here the uh, world uh, affairs and everything and what's going on overseas. And it's, it's a very low place. The heart's in a good place. God had worked that into Job. The Lord gave. The Lord taketh away. All that I have is from you, Lord. Everything. My very being is from you. Naked I came, naked I depart. Luke chapter 12, we're not going to look at that, but uh, it's a parable of the rich fool where he's, he's building barns. He's a very successful farmer. And uh, I told you, uh, coming back from one of the missions trips, there was a guy by the name of Phil I was sitting with. He's a financial advisor, a young man in his 30s. He advises people about it, their future. And so as I'm talking with him and sharing, the Lord, I built a relationship with him. I said, if, you know, if this plane goes down, Phil, do you know where you'd spend eternity? And he, he looked. It was like I said something, like some rocket scientist, some deep theological truth. He said, I never thought about it. And I'll, it just, uh, but this rich... Uh, farmer here, he, his barns were full, and he says, you know what, he says, uh, he's so focused on self, you know, the Dead Sea's dead, nothing can live in it, because there's no outlet, no giving, if you want to be dead, just keep focused on you, yourself, and I, you know what helped me to get out of trouble, you know what helped me to, in my sorrow, my, my struggle, my pain, if you pour yourself out, Isaiah 58, to the hungry, to the poor and needy, you should be well watered, the Lord will guide you continually, and it goes on and on. But as long as we're poor me, me, myself, and I. But, you know, Nabal was dead. The word Nabal means foolish. He was focused on himself. He wouldn't share any of his food with David. So it's, it's Jesus. It's about him. It's following him. So the rich farmer says, I know what I'm going to do. He's thinking within himself here. You know, he, doesn't, he knows enough not to go around telling people. He says, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to tear these barns down. I'm going to build bigger and bigger barns, so I'm, going to, I'm set for the future. I can eat, drink, and be merry, and I'm set. I can kick back and relax with ease, and the Lord says, you fool. You fool. You, you can be a Christian and be a fool. The Lord says that. I always thought the, when it says a wise man and a foolish man builds his house upon a rock, and a foolish man on sin, I always thought that was saved and unsaved. <laughs> it can relate to that, but it's saved and saved. You come there week after week here, and that was a nice message, but you don't ever apply it to your life. All you are is a hearer. The preaching of the gospel is not conclusive in and of itself. It's the preaching and the receiving. As you do, the, the, the preaching and the, as you do the word, don't be deceived, brethren. Don't be deceived. And all the way through the scriptures. You know, it's, uh, you know, I brings me to mind on a Sunday morning at the Lester household 20 well probably 30 years ago now my nephew was staying overnight it was Sunday morning and I'd say hey this is a day the Lord has made that's how I'd wake him up and my sons would be wouldn't even, hey they wouldn't even move and my nephew was there 
I, I woke him up and he got up and he got dressed and he was out at the table eating breakfast. This was a Sunday morning. I went, wow. I said, I said you can stay here anytime you want. I told him it was time to get up. He, he moved on it. He responded. He, he was out there. And my sons are going. <sighs> Moving on the word. Obeying what he's speaking to you. He's speaking to you right now. He's speaking to you about something. Do whatever he tells you to do. But the Bible says that, man, you fool. Your life tonight is going to be required of you. And then who's going to get all that stuff you work for? So it's man gives his energy and strength and spends and makes money and builds money, 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 and builds up and only to pass it, only to pass it on. And if you, you're not careful, I, I think it was Billy Graham. I like that. He said, I'm not passing on a bunch of money to his kids and grandkids. I think he gave them a little piece of ground. I think he gave them some, something, each one of them. He didn't leave them all a bunch of money. He put it back in the ministry. That's wise. Now, oh, you're not taking care of your family. Who is your family? Those who do the will of God, that's your family. That's who, that's who your family is. Jesus, your, your mother and brothers are outside. Jesus looked right at him and said, who is your mother, who is your brother? Those who do the will of God. We ought to be closer to them who, who, who are obeying or in the will of God than we are even our natural, if that makes any sense. Okay, I'm going to go a different direction here. I want to talk about how Job withstood all these religious people. The answer of a good conscience, I thought of Mike when he says at the end many times, is everything clear? Is everything clear? Job had the answer of a good conscience through all he went through. These guys were, came, bombarded him over and over and with evil. You, you must have sin. Your kids must have sinned. Or God wouldn't have did that. Or you this, there, and that. As you, as as the book goes on, Job's getting seemingly more strong in the Lord and the, the, the speeches of the men are tailing off, so to speak. But the answer of a good conscience before God, it, it, there's a strength. Daniel was, uh, when he heard that the word was uh, proclaimed, they, he was squeaky clean. They couldn't find anything wrong with Daniel. Boy, what a testimony. Hey, what about that pan? We, we can't find anybody that would say anything. She's squeaky clean. We got to find something against her God. And they, they made a decree up to just try to, and Daniel, knowing full well about the decree, he opened his windows up and he prayed. He was one of an excellent spirit. He had the strength of a good conscience. He was right before God. He was right, and uh, he was the strength of a good conscience. We're going to look at that. Let's go to uh, 1, Peter, or 1 Timothy 1. There's no way that, that he could have withstood all these religious... You know, when you go through things, it doesn't hurt for someone to try to encourage you instead of pushing you down. Someone, I've said this before and I'll say it again, but somebody said to my, my wife, said it to me, but she was just getting in the car. You wouldn't believe us, Amos. They said, uh, you know, I know exactly how you feel about your daughter. We had to put her dog down recently. I looked at him and I said, are, are you serious? I said, are you serious? But with the Lord there, he's right away. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. And you have to do that. You have to say that. Not just say, but it's got to be out of your being. He didn't just say that once, by the way. We miss it in the Greek there, but it's, Father, forgive them. Saying, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. So someone actually said to my wife also, do you know that she won't even have to go through the teenage years with her kids. True story. And I think they were born again Christians. Well, at least the one was. Religious people. Religious Christians. Don't be religious. Be, be one who just sees your need for God. Don't throw stones. God doesn't send you out to, in this world to condemn the world, but through your lives that you bring others to salvation. He doesn't send you out to condemn the world. I know John 3.16 is a great verse, but John 3.17 is every bit the, the better of it. For God sends not His Son in, into the world, sons and daughters in the world, to condemn the world, but through their lives that you bring salvation. 
So when everybody's talking about the government, you're not. Everybody talking about the bosses, you're not. Everybody talking about the sports team, you're not saying a word. Everybody talking about this and how the weather, and you're just, Lord, you're enduring it, whatever it is, Lord. And I'm not quite there yet. He's working. I'm learning. This, this, this Christian life's a learning process. So don't condemn yourself. Look to the Lord, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Though a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again. You know, Tony Sr., that, that verse encouraged me a couple years ago. Doesn't say a sinner or a wicked person, though a righteous man falls seven times. I did some a couple years ago, and I thought, I, I'm finished. I thought I disqualified myself. I'm finished. <laughs> but I looked to the Lord, and he helped me. And you know, Though a righteous man falls seven times, he keeps building altars. He keeps, he keeps, keeps repenting, keeps confessing his sins. Abram became Abraham. He fouled up all the time. Read the scriptures. They all fouled up. <laughs> Rahab lies, and she's in the, the lineage of Christ. <laughs> she's in the hero uh, hero chapter. They went of that away. They said the righteous Rahab. She, she lied. It was a righteous lie. Figure it out. You figure it out. 1 Timothy chapter 1. It would be good if you even look these up. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 5. I know when I was in Bible school, I was writing these verses down. And what I'd do, I'd go home. And I would, look, I would look, look them back up again, and I'd chew on them. I'd remember what the teacher was saying. See, that's a way of learning. You, you write the verses down. You... But, but don't, don't be worried about writing things down. I'd rather you be listening. There's guys that come up to the Bible study. That one Mormon friend of mine, he says, I didn't bring up any Bible up. I said, you bring your heart up. That's all you need. But, you know, it's nice if you have your Bible. But write the verses down, and then, and then through the week, go back over them. 1 Timothy chapter 1, we're talking about the conscious. 1 Timothy chapter 1, 5, now the end of the commandment is love out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Verse 6, from which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law. So there were some here that defiled their, their, their conscience. They didn't have a clear conscience anymore. They had swerved. You ever, on the road, you see an animal coming, you swerve. Many Christians have swerved off the, the, the narrow path. They swerved from what? A pure heart, a good conscience, a genuine faith. They've swerved. They're no longer following. I won't go to Proverbs 28.1, but you can write that down. Look at the righteous are bold as a lion. I think of Pastor Jim, though. The righteous are bold as a lion. First, I told him that, too, the first time I heard him speak. I, I said, man, he's cocky. But it wasn't a cockiness. It was a confidence. It's actually a weakness. In the, the, those who are right are bold as a lion. They're bold. And Job, he was, he was firing away, although he was hurting and he was, he, you know, he was speaking truth. He had the answer of a good conscience. How did he withstand all them religious people? Them three friends. And the fourth one, the Lord doesn't rebuke the fourth one. He, there was some truth there. Acts 23, 1. I say, Lord, don't let me grow cold. You know, one time we used to consume his word. You remember when you were newly saved? And, wow, couldn't get enough. Lord, keep that fire burning. Lord, and sometimes I'm kind of dry. And I say, Lord, help me. Help me. Stir up in me, Lord. Stir up that, that strong desire to continue on. Acts 23, 1. And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And some high priest smacked him in the face for saying that. You know, Paul, this is, Paul says, uh, Men and brethren, unto this day I've kept my heart right. I've lived in all good conscience before God until this day. 
What's a good conscience? One who's responding to the Lord. We're right there, Acts 24, 16. And herein do I exercise myself to always have a conscious void of offense towards God and all men. Paul didn't have to go to the gym, but he exercised himself to always stay right with God and all men. As much as depends upon you. If somebody hates you or me, that's, that's not on me. I mean, unless, unless I've not done my part, but as much as it depends upon you, live at peace with all men. You guard your heart. You can't guard somebody else's heart. The only control Job had in this whole book was his words and his own heart. He had no control of anything else. Paul says, I always exercise myself. This was the key to his ministry. Lord, I'm right. I have a good conscience. So that, that they ring that part up and this girl come out and it was a Moog part, a $175 part. And I was bringing back a $123 part. She said, wow, that's, that's, a, I said, that's, <laughs> thank you, Lord. That's a Moog part. That's a $175 part. But I said, ma'am, I said, that's, that's not the right part. Why? Because God's working there. He's working there in the little things. In the things you don't think he is. Despise not today as small things. Well, that's just small. You know, I just, uh, if you collect, you know, well, I work clothes. I own my income tax, $50. You know, that's just small. You know, did you spend $50 on, you know, for work clothes and your income tax? All these little things. He looks at all that. You don't lie to, you don't lie to that guy there. You don't lie at the, when you exchange a car, you buy a car. You don't, you don't lie to the tax people. You lie to God. You want a good conscience before God? That's what he wants us to have, a pure conscience. That's how Job had a right conscience. That's how he endured all that he went through. Elisha and Elijah, they kept saying the same thing, as the Lord liveth before whom I stand. And then they would go on and say this and that. It was a, I don't believe it was just a catchphrase. They were aware they were standing before the Lord. As the Lord liveth before whom I stand. It's an inward state. You're upright in your heart. You're not falling over. You're not wicked. You're not wickedly turned away. You don't follow your eyes, your own heart. I'm the Lord your God, it says in Numbers. You're not. You know, as Christians, we can be God of our own life. Small g. We can map out our own course. The Lord says, that's a wicked sin. I tell the guys down at jail and even, even doing weddings, I said, you know, the major sin in the Bible that I see, I didn't see this until probably about 10 years ago, is a sin of you living for you, Christian. You being in the pilot seat, you doing what you want to do, go where you want to go. I'm going to go to this church here because I, I like it. It's a half-hour church service. You jump out of there, and it's close to my house. It, it serves. It, it, I'm very sad. Bear with me here. Don't get mad at me. I'm very satisfied with it. You may want to go to a church. It, you know, the Word of God's pricking your heart. You may not feel real good. But God's at work. I wonder how many people go to the church that God's leading them to go instead of the church God should it has, has them in. Do we ever check in with the Lord? Where do you want me? I, I left the church. It was five minutes from my house to drive a half hour to church. We, uh, my family filled a family pew there. Uh, my mom, sisters, brother. We all filled a family pew. But the Lord, you know, I met a guy at the, the airlines and he spoke the word to me. And I realized, you know, he, his stir was going into me. My wife, I looked at her and we were on the same page. I didn't, we didn't tell anybody. We went to, I went to the pastor and after a year later, I asked him if I could go to Bible school. I came under him. I asked him if I could go to Bible school. Isn't that strange? I asked him to go to Bible school down in Hopewell. I wanted to come under him. See, there's some people who won't submit to anybody. I submitted under him to go to Bible school. And then after I was done there, the Lord really started stirring in my heart to leave the church. And I said, Paul, can I see you? Three years later, after I graduated from Bible school, as I was graduating, I said, Pastor Paul, can I see you? He said, yeah. And I said, Pastor Paul, the Lord is leading us out. We are leaving in the will of God. You know, the Lord showed me already. You know, following the Lord, he gives you vision 10 years down the road even. When the Lord led us to send... Uh, our kids in the Christian school, the Lord led that. He said, if your son goes to Blackhawk and comes right up through, he's talented. Everybody thinks their kids are talented. My younger son was talented. He was coming up through John Miller. 
And the Lord showed me he could get a scholarship. Even my dad said, he's good, he's good. Scholarship, college, meets a woman out in Idaho that doesn't have any fear of God. I've missed it. We followed God's leading. I couldn't, I couldn't lay my head in my father's lap. <laughs> I, I drove old cars so I could send $400 a month to pay it to Christians. Well, that was a lot of money back then. I like my dad. He reinstates with my kids. You know, your dad could have many new cars. He could have many new cars, but I saw value in my kids. And that's not, don't condemn yourself. Right away, you're thinking right away, you're condemning yourself. But you see value as you follow him. Today's the day of salvation. What we've done in the back is gone. Keep making decisions today. Keep following him. I like Sean. Oh, I, I really like that boy. I really do. We had a good talk at last when he came there. Spaghetti, he brought his uh, sauce here. I really like him. I really like him. And many times we, we look at the over here, over there. Sometimes as a pastor, we're focused on who isn't here today. And we miss the people that are here. But I never drove any junk. I remember being the same way if we're good parents. A good parent remembers how they were when they were young. I'd duck down. My brother would have a push-button heater going into the high school. And I'd push down. Or he had a push-button heater. I'd duck down, make sure nobody saw me. 20 years, I don't know how many years later, 20 years later, I'm pulling in Dairy Mart, Dairy, my daughter sliding down to the seat. I don't want anybody to see me. There weren't any fenders waving. There weren't any rust. I bought... Uh, aunt, aunt so-and-so's car, 15 years old, 30,000 miles, buy for $1,000, keep it 10 years, sell for 1000 Cars n never, never valued. I told the guys in counseling, I said, and I'm not condemning anybody, you need a good car. <laughs> you need a dependable car. You know? And please don't misunderstand, but I tell them in counseling, you know, you go out and you buy all these new cars that you're newly married. And at one time, you look at the junkyard and everybody oohed and on. <laughs> wow. Look at the most junkiest car or truck you know of. See it at a junkyard. And at one time, ooh, wow. Look at that car. Look at them wheels. The Lord wants to open up our vision. You know, to see what real value is. All that stuff will rust. Lay not your up for yourselves treasures on the earth. But lay yourself treasures up in heaven. That's people. You're kingdom. We're, we're kingdom minded. We're following him. Let's go to uh, 1 Peter. A few more here. 1 Peter. 1 Peter 2. The idea, the strength that was in Job because he was right with God. The strength that can be you and me, no matter what trial you're facing, if you're right with God. That's a great strength. It really is. It's a great strength to know you're right with Him. First Peter 2, 19 and 20. This is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief. If you have a good conscience towards God and you're, you're going through grief, you're going through problems, heartache. This is even in the workplace here. Suffering wrongfully. You know, you, you're trying to do everything you write before God and the world's beating you up. The Lord says, I'm looking at your heart. If you're, if you're taking a beating for conscience sake, you know, it, it's good. That's so what he says here. It is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when you are buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently. But when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently. This is acceptable with God. Your heart's right in it all. Somebody said about Job, you know, I uh, heard a preach. Remember, somebody made a comment. About Job, I don't think he was too patient. They said about the patience in Job and James there. But, uh, but when I think of Job, I think of patient, pa patient continuing. Something like that. He was, he was continuing in the way. And we look at words, and you know, he cursed the day he was born. When he was going through all his emotional state, God was looking at his heart. God didn't hold anything out against him. He knew what he was going through.
strength of a... And, you know, we, we talk about the... Uh, We talk about Ephesians there, the armor of God. I like the uh, girding yourself up with a belt. You know, they used to wear them long girdles. And you gird it up, gird up your loins with a belt of truth and with a breastplate of righteousness. What's that mean? You're right. Do you know there's Christians that aren't right with God? Read the Bible. This is it. You have to work at this. This doesn't, this doesn't come automatic because you got born again 30 years ago. Are you walking with Him today? Are you loving Him? Are you obeying Him? 1 Peter 3, 16. Having a good conscience. We're talking about conscience. That whereas they speak evil of you, and they did a job, as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. I had a guy tell me one time, and he actually mentioned to somebody else, and they came to me and said, you know, I, I was overboard a little bit, but I didn't leave the Lord. I was excited with the Lord. I had some health issues. Can I say, I, I had prostate infections. And I met a guy up the airport, uh, well, I'd known him before, and he started telling me about eating, eating healthy and what he's doing. And I changed my fuel going in, it went away. And I said, whoa. And, you, and I had a guy tell me and said, hey, you left the Lord. Why is it that we don't ever talk about how you take care of the temple? We know you're not supposed to run around and sleep with other people and all this other stuff. How about taking care of the temple? Huh. Who eats worse than Christians sometimes? I don't want to go there, but I'm just saying. Are we, are we adding to our own misery sometimes? But I, the point I'm saying is a guy say to me, Glenn, you're, you're talking about eating that way more than you are about the Lord. I've been accused of being proud over the years guy at the uh, airlines whose father passed away recently and gave him a big hug and he, he's, op he's opening up to me. He, he's opening. It takes if I'd heard myself 30 years ago speak like I am now I'd say you're nuts. But I see the Lord leaking on him. He, the Lord's working in his life. He said to me he says after the study he walked out on me. He shook my hand and there was only three of us in there. He said you he come over shook my hand and said you preach like that I'm out of here. And I looked at the other guy and said what would you say? I said all I was preaching the word. But I saw him later on the day. He says, uh, I don't know what, he said something. And I said, well, a sixth grader doesn't know what a ninth grader knows. There you go again. You're being proud. I'm not being proud. I'm just telling you. Someone accused Charles Hahn, which was Jake Luffy's uh, mentor, one of his mentors, uh, having something in his heart. And Charles Hahn says, not in this heart. Not in this heart. See, we would do well to you know, guard your heart. That's what the scripture says. We want to guard everybody else's heart. You know, we have a full plate right here. But the Lord's provided a way that we can have a right conscience before Him. We confess our sins. In 321, this is the answer of a good, good uh, conscience. So every time that these, these religious people here, and they, they weren't novices, they had something in God. But they took things out of context and they, they heaped, heaped it on him. Verse 21, talking about Noah and the ark. It says, The like figure where unto even baptism doth now save us, not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God. Jo Every time that they, they said something to Job, he could have said, I answer you with a good conscience before God. I answer you with a good conscience before God. I answer you with a good conscience before God. That'll be our anchor holding us, you know, in a held Job, whatever he was going through there. Uh, that's what ho held Daniel, that he could, he could be bold. He could be bold as a lion. He's bold. Even though when the decree was written and the threat was going in the lion's den, you know, he was bold as a lion. <clears throat> Two more scriptures, first John. Do you know that you do know that all Christians don't walk in the light? You do know that. If you read first John there, 
You got the light, brother? I got the light, brother. You got the light, brother? I got the light, brother. I'm born again. Are you walking in the light? It's a command in Scripture in 1 John. I never knew that until I went to Bible school. I thought all Christians, you're in the light no matter, because you're born again, you got the light the rest of your life, no matter what you do, where you go, what you think about, you're in the light, brother. That's, that was my, you know, my, you know, that's what I thought. Then I go to Bible school and they start opening up this Scripture to me. 1 John 1, but if we walk in the light, he's writing this to Christians. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And that could really be us and God or us and each other. As Mike continues to obey the Lord and confessing his sins, I continue to obey the Lord, we have fellowship. So as we walk in the light, He walks in the light, two things happen. We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His, his Son, cleanses us from all sins. So there's like an automatic car wash going on. He's cleansing me of sins I'm not even aware of. As we're walking in the light... And confessing our sins. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, He's faithful to forgive and cleanse us from all that's unright in us. If we confess, if we confess. So walking in the light, all these wicked men had defiled conscience, even the one that smacked Paul there. His conscience was defiled. You know, defiled conscience. Do you have the answer of a good conscience before God tonight? You, do I, have a good conscience before God? Do you have the answer of a good conscience before God? Last verse, Psalm. Uh, well, many times in the Psalms it says, I, I will keep my integrity. I've walked in my integrity. Do you remember Job in the first chapter when his wife said, Curse God and die. Quit holding on to your integrity and curse God and die. That's what the enemy wants us to do, curse God and die. When we go through things, curse God and die. He don't want you to stay alive in Him. You know, there's dead Christians. Read the Bible. Why didn't I hear any of this? Because it's not taught. It says in Revelation, you have a reputation for being alive, Revelation 3, but you're dead. The wages of sin is death. We relate that to the world being saved. They put that on a Bible track. And, you know, somebody lifts it out of the Bible, puts it on a Bible track, and sends it out to the unsaved world. And I say it's, it belongs in the church. It can fit out there, but that's not... It was lifted out in context to Christians. The payment for your sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life. Jesus came that you might, might have life and might have more abundantly. So Psalm 24, we're going to close there. So Job's wife said, curse God and die. You're holding on to your integrity. And the Lord, when he called Satan in round two, he says, hey, what do you think of my servant Job? Although you, you caused me to come against him, he's still holding fast to his integrity. He's still in there. He's still keeping his heart right. He still has the answer of a good conscience. Do you have the answer of a good conscience tonight? Are you clear before him? All known sin confessed. And you can confess it right now, whatever the Lord's shown you in your heart. Don't let the enemy dangle and say, boy, you blow it. You're not as good as that person. You, you know. if, if you confess your sins, if you don't confess it, he don't, he, he. somebody says, well, that's the unpardonable sin. You blaspheme the Holy Spirit. You know what I see in that? Blaspheme the Holy Spirit isn't like he said about the devil. I blaspheme you. We blas the only sin God can't forgive is one that's not confessed. He forgives all sin if you truly repent of it. But you blaspheme the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is convicting. He's working in that. So even God's account of him says he's holding on to his integrity. What, hold, what holds me in the way? What holds you in the way when people come against you? People say things. Huh, you're not, you left the Lord. You're eating healthy. Well, excuse me. I want to, even my father, I love him dearly. He was getting on me about eating healthy. You know, I, I don't know what it is. I guess people, the discipline, may, I don't know. And I, you know, I told the guys at work, I said, you know, they, you may, I told a couple of them, I want you to be pallbearers. I don't want any of my kids to be pallbearers. I want six unbelievers to be pallbearers. Six of my friends. I want them. I, I said, you, you'll get a good laugh. You, you might be in my funeral. There's, we don't have no guarantees on life. We have a guarantee that, that he's the life. 
There's no one like him. No one touches my heart like he does. And so it's, uh, but, but the answer of a good conscience. Glenn, you're, you're doing this, you're doing that. Uh, Lord, am I, am I proud? Lord, am I, am I, and I've been accused in other areas, not given to this certain thing, not given to this, and people don't know the whole story and they're saying things. But I, I let that go. You know, it's words for the wind, Job says. You know, words for the wind. You know, people say things, you, you just let it go. And when they say things and are going through things, you just let words for the wind. Psalm 15, 1. You can read all verse 5 verses. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? The psalmist is saying, Lord, who, who can abide in your tabernacle? All Israel? He says, no. He that walketh, that's, that's inwardly, walketh, that's presently, upright, and worketh righteousness, and speaks the truth in his heart. David, when he repented in Psalm 51, the Lord says, I desire truth in the where? Inward parts. I like an honest person. I like an honest person. He goes down there and he says, He, he that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. And I sometimes, even as you're holding things out, Lord, what's that mean? My father in law, he was cutting some wood for the neighbor. He, it, the tree had come down and he said, I'm, Can I have the wood? I'll, take, I'll cut the tree up and get it out of there. You know, for the wood, the guy said, all right, go ahead. And after we got about three or four cuts, it was all rotted. And I said, Pap, it's all rotted. He says, doesn't matter. I promise, I swear to my own hurt. I swore that I would clean this up, get this out of here, whether it's good wood or not good wood. Do you have a, a steadfastness in your character like that? Do you have integrity like that? I learned something from my father-in-law. He says, he that doeth these things shall never be moved. And again, I've said Jesus. Pilate thought he would move Jesus. <laughs> and the Lord moved Pilate. I got control over you. The only control you have is what my Father's given you. I said last one, but I'm, this is the last one. Psalm 24. I didn't look that word ascend there, but Psalm 24. They asked the question there. The psalmist there, David again. So we're talking about ascending. Who shall abide in your holy hill? Who's dwelling? Who, who walking uprightly? It's in your heart. This Christian life is all a matter of the heart. There's a verse in Hebrews 10 that says, uh, Sacrifices and offerings I get no pleasure out of. But what I, what I, what I do, I, I take away the first to establish the second. See, the people were sacrificing offerings and burnt offerings in Hebrews chapter 10 there. They were substituting their relationship, O Lord, for doing things. And the Lord says, I, I got no pleasure in that. I take away your, you know, the Lord's working all your life to take your will out of the way. Do you know that? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We all say that on earth as it is in heaven. But no, my will be done. My kingdom come, my will be done, Lord. You bless me. Oh, no, no, no. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on the earth so it's you know there it says I delight to do your will O God Jesus speaking there he says he takes away the first to establish the second and that establishing the second is that his his will it's a process that he's worked into you he got to work it in he not nevertheless not my will but your will be done see this is the gospel that you're not living for you whether I feel like coming here tonight or don't feel like it has nothing to do with it it's a will of God. Whether I feel like going to the church I go to or don't feel like it, I'm called to be there. I told my pastor a year or so ago, it's never been in our hearts to leave the church. I never expressed that before, but I, you know, I won't go any further than that. But I said, I've never, I, it's never been in my thought to leave the church. David asked the question, Psalm 24, verse 3, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in those holy places? Who? Who shall stand? Who shall ascend? Who should progress, go up? He that has clean hands and a pure heart, he hath not lifted up his soul in vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive blessing from the Lord. 
Well, we want God to bless us. And, you know, it's... Someone asked me one time, why don't you come over here and pray through the house and bless our house? I said, I will. I'll do that, but you bring the blessing in your house by your obedience or disobedience. And I'll, I'll pray in each room, I'll, you know, whatever it is. You want me to do it, I'll pray. I'll, I'll do that. But you bring the blessing in your life or not. You bring the curse in your life if not. Growing up, we always heard about the blessings of God. The Lord is my shepherd. He blesses, He follows you. He does, but what about if you disobey? You know, there's cursings. <laughs> Paul says something, I'll close this. Paul says something profound in 1 Corinthians 16, I believe it's 31. At the end there, the last few verses, he says, Anyone who loveth not the Lord, he's talking to Christians, let him be accursed. Tell us how you really feel, Paul. So it's, the Lord wants repentance. He's looking for an agreement with them. But uh, that's all I have.